Hello everyone, my name is Amanda Pfeiffer and I'm an Education Coordinator at the Canadian Light Source. Uh, today here we have Zach Person who's going to be talking to us about Excel. So Zach, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of who you are and what you do? Okay, um, I'm Zach Person. I'm currently a master's student in Environment Sustainability. Um, my educational history has had me playing around in the Sigatron about four years now. Um, just getting familiar with a lot of data and how to look at data and how to play with data, especially using Excel. Um, using, ex or, yeah, playing with Synchrotron data has gotten me like very familiar with using Excel and um, some tips and tricks about it all and how to get things done quickly and efficiently. Um, yeah, so I guess here's So You Want to Excel. Uh, I'll just be going over the intro to the basics of Excel, and it'll be specifically geared towards using Synchrotron data. <clears throat> so first, I just wanted to go through um, what a workbook is and what a spreadsheet is. Uh, so when you open Excel, you will create a new workbook. Um, and what a workbook is is just a, <laughs> an accumulation of a bunch of different spreadsheets. Um, spreadsheets are all these cells you see on the screen. Uh, it's where your data will go, and it's where you can play with your data and manipulate it and change it for your liking. Um, in the bottom here, you can see that it says sheet one. Uh, you can actually rename those sheets, and you can add a bunch of more sheets. I think I've had up to like 25 or 30 sheets in one uh, workbook. Uh, the bigger workbook you have, the more likely it is to crash, so just try to keep them quite small. But you can add as many sheets as you want. I need to put my laser on. Right down here is where the sheets are and where you can add more sheets. Um, <clears throat> and so just a little bit more about spreadsheets. Uh, you can see here I have them labeled. Columns are your vertical um, lines here, I guess. Uh, they're labeled as letters. And then you have cells, which are, or sorry, you have rows, which are horizontal. And then you have cells, which is an overlap of a column and a row. And they're labeled by uh, letters followed by a number. So if you said you wanted to go to cell C3, that would be right here. And um, that will help you with your formulas in the future and all that. Um, in the top here, we, just, we have a bunch of different options, uh, much like a Microsoft Word document. You can change your font. You can play around. Um, this little square here is how to put outlines and boxes in your cells. Uh, you can separate your data and keep things nice and clean. Um, over here, you can change colors of your cells and tables, and you can create turn cells into a table quite easily using these buttons. Um, and you can filter and sort your data, and um, there's some already calculate or already made formulas in this part of the spreadsheet here. Um, you see up top, you have the home, insert, draw, et cetera. Um, these tabs are much like a Word document. You can insert pictures and other files and um, different uh, pieces of data. Uh, you can draw, which the, that's not a function I use, but I guess if you want to draw on your screen, you could. Uh, page layout is useful if you're going to be working with data that you want to print. Um, you can create your print. Uh, printing area and your page set up to make sure that everything fits on a page when you're going to print it or put it into a Word document. Uh, formulas is useful if you're using your data to do statistics or calculate. Um, Excel actually works really good for like creating budgets and stuff. Uh, but for Synchrotron data, you might use it to sum up a bunch of rows uh, to average a bunch of X or F data. So that, those, that tab might be useful. And then the data tab actually isn't something I really use, for, especially for um, Synchrotron data. And then review and view are just like Word documents. Um, so that's just a basic overview of a workbook and a spreadsheet. Um, yeah. Also, the numbers, um, the row numbers and the column letters are basically um, infinite. You can't really run out. Um, so that's really good for Synchrotron data because Typically, there will be thousands and thousands of rows of, of rows of data. And that's why Excel is great to use, because you can um, click thousands of pieces of data in one second. 
Um, when it goes to saving your work, it's a really important uh, piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> as soon as you open your Synchrotron data in a workbook, it's best to uh, save it as a file on your computer, or in your iCloud, or in your Dropbox, wherever you want to save it. Um, so just go into File and click Save As, or uh, press Command S or Control if you're using PC. So every time I say Command and then a letter or something to do uh, a shortcut, use Control if you're using PC. Um, but yeah, you just want to go into File and Save As and just save it immediately as you open it because then it's it's saved right from the beginning and you don't have to worry about that after you've worked for four hours and maybe forget to save it. Um, give your workbook a really detailed name and save it somewhere easy to find. So create folders and in those folders, create folders and in those folders, create folders. Uh, oftentimes, if you're doing synchrotron research, you're going to have a lot of data that comes your way and you'll use a lot of samples. And for each sample, you might collect various types of data. So I, I usually find it's best to create a folder that might be like one site or one subset of samples. And then within that, you have each uh, separate sample. And give it a really nice detailed name. Um, so I have an example here, uh, zperson underscore aspen1 underscore xrf. Um, that way I know it's my first aspen tree, um, it's my file, and it's an xrf scan. And you can get even way more detailed than that. And I just always use underscores to separate words in my files. I find it just keeps everything cleaner for some reason. I don't know. Um, but it is a way that I like to save my data. And I just put an example of not what not to do. Like, don't just name it XRF graph for every XRF graph you have. Um, because you're going to kick yourself in the butt when you go to look at this data and create plots out of it uh, in the future. It might seem quick and easy at the time, but it, that extra time giving it a good name is going to save you in the future. Uh, also, just get used to pressing Command S. Um, I probably press it two or three times every minute when I'm doing uh, Excel work with Synchrotron data. I've had many, many Excel workbooks crash on me in the middle of data analysis, and I'll lose an hour or two worth of work. And that can be one of the most frustrating things when you've created 20 plots and you lose them all and have to do it all over again. Um, whereas you can just get used to pressing Command S or Control S if you're using PC. Um, and you just you can save yourself if it crashes. And if it does crash, it is kind of expected, especially if you're using um, a laptop or an older laptop or just a computer that doesn't have uh, the guts to keep up with big workbooks. Uh, this is just an example of what my iCloud drive looks like with my data. So <clears throat> this is only, this is maybe an eighth of what else is in this folder. Uh, so you can see I give things really, really long detailed names. And it might look like a mess to other people, but I know exactly what every single one of these names mean. And th that's what's important, that I can open a file and know exactly what I'm going to be looking at. And I don't need to search through five or 10 large Excel files to see what I'm looking for. Um, I have folders within folders. So for example, um, the overall folder is called something like Zach CLS data. And then I have a folder that says Trembling Aspen. And then under Trembling Aspen, I have uh, this specific tree core, so 18ELF08. So that's one tree core. And within that, I have six uh, documents of data for this one single tree core. So this is one sample. And so that's why it's so important to label your data correctly, because you're going to have multiple files for each sample. And I can see exactly what each of these are and which one I might need to open to look at or take a plot from or work on. And so I do that with all of my core samples. And then I have the same core sample here, 18EL F07, as I do down here. But this is in a different folder because it was actually a different project where I was looking at something else completely from what I was looking at down here. So you just want to make sure you have everything really, really organized. And folders are going to be your best friend when sorting Synchrotron data. OK. Um, so in this presentation, I created a list of some shortcuts and functions that I've found to be very helpful over the years. Uh, 
a lot of people do actually already know these, but some people don't. And um, when I've worked with a lot of first year groups, when I teach them these simple like select all or undo, copy, cut, paste, it is a game changer for them when they're playing with Synchrotron data because they don't need to do all those extra clicks on the mouse. And it actually does save them quite a bit of time. Um, so I just wanted to list these here, and especially in this, if it's a YouTube video, it can be paused, and people can just have this up so that they can see these uh, good shortcuts or write them down or whatever. But if you uh, are going to play Synchrotron data, you're going to be your fingers are going to get used to using all of these, and you'll just be flying through the data. Um, I also wanted to give some information about formulas. Uh, Excel is a very useful tool, whether using XRF or uh, synchrotron data or not, to just do simple math or even more complex math. Um, and you can do that by using equals to start a formula. And as soon as you type an equal into a cell, Excel recognizes that it's about to do a math equation. And so you can use plus, uh, minus, or the asterisk, and that's for addition, subtraction, or multiplication. Um, you can also use a slash for division. Um, use brackets to start and end a range or separate formulas. So you could do you could average two pieces of data, like I have an example here. I want to average cells A1 to A6, but then add it to the average of B1 to B6. And I actually have an example of that on this page here. So I just threw some numbers into Excel to give um, an image example of what I'm talking about. And so if you wanted to average cells A1 to A6, you're just going to type in equals average. And then you can either click and drag and highlight these or type in manually A cells A1 to A6. Um, and then all you have to do is press Enter, and it'll give you the average. Um, and then you can just like click and drag. Uh, there's a little green box here. If you click and drag that to here, it'll automatically uh, average all of these cells as well. And that's a really, um, really useful feature that I actually just found out in the last year that this little box will do for you. You, just, you can just drag it around, and Excel will do the work for you. <clears throat> and then just an exa the example I gave in the last one, if you wanted to average this uh, column and then this column, but add the averages together, all you have to do is type in the two formulas and put brackets around them and put a plus in between. So you're just doing exactly what you did here, but adding a plus and then the average of the next one. And it's a, it is a really quick and easy way to get some math done there, uh, average data or whatever you want to do. Uh, just a short formula cheat sheet. It might help some people if they're doing some statistics or averaging XRF data, which is actually done quite a bit. Uh, so the first formula is equals average, so that's just going to average any data that you highlight. Uh, equals sum is just going to sum any data that you highlight, and equals product is going to um, multiply any data that you highlight. There's also uh, formulas like equals count, I think, which will count the amount of samples you have, or uh, data, count the amount of data points you have in your data set, I guess, would be how it goes. Um, but those are all listed in the formula section of Excel that I showed at the very beginning of the video. Uh, there, that's how I've learned how to, to find all of my formulas or how to use formulas. Um, if you Google or YouTube a very specific thing, usually it can come up. Like I think one point I was writing a report, and I needed to find out how one cell could create an average and divide it by a certain number based on the data that I input into a report. And so you can start doing really complex things um, just by adding like little basic steps like equals average together. So that's all available usually online. Um, so a huge thing that we do with synchrotron data is creating scatter plots. And they're quite easy to make. So once you have a, a set of data, which I will be showing in the next slide, uh, you're going to want to highlight it. And you can go into the Insert tab on the top of the page, click on Scatter, and then create a scatter plot with straight or curved lines. It depends how you want it to look. Um, and you'll just need an X and Y to plot in your data set. But I'll show that in the next slide. So 
I just created a really quick example here. I, did, I didn't want to throw in uh, synchrotron data just because if you're unfamiliar with Excel, it can be a lot to look at at one time, whereas this is just a very simple, very easy to understand data set. So we have a month, and for each month, we have an average temperature. And I want to plot this as a scatter plot. So all I have to do is click and highlight the whole data set, or I can click on A and drag it to B. Just play around. You're not going to hurt the data. See what works best for you. Some people, everyone has a different way of wanting to do it. Or you could click on one and drag all the way to 13. It just it depends on the person. Um, but once you have your, your data set highlighted, you want to go into insert, which is up here. And then you're going to go into, these are all the different chart types. And actually, sometimes different chart types work better for different types of data. But definitely for synchrotron data, you're going to want to go into scatter plots. And then I usually use scatter plots with straight lines, but usually you get pretty similar results if you use scatter plots with curved lines, which is this one here. And then all you have to do is click it, and you will get this plot pop up. And so this is a illustration of the average temperature throughout time, the months on the bottom and the temperature on the side. And this is very easy, and now you can see how temperature changes throughout the year. Uh, and then with these plots, so typically when you plot a graph, it's going to have nothing in it except for numbers on the y-axis and numbers on the x-axis. It won't have this month, it won't have temperature, and it won't have a title. So these are very, very important things to do with your data. If you don't label your data, nobody has no, any idea what they're looking at when they go to look at it. And if you need help with it or you're trying to present it to somebody and all you have is this numbers on each side with like a curve, it means nothing to nobody, um, or nothing to anybody, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and so what you're going to want to do is just click on the chart. And when you click on the chart, a chart design button should pop up in the top. Um, click on, if It doesn't automatically take you there. Click on the chart design button. And you'll see this button here. And I think it's called Add Chart Elements. And when you click on that, you'll get a whole list of things. Uh, so these are really fun to play with if you want to see what they do. Uh, you can change your axes. You can add axes titles, which you should always, always, always do is add axes titles. So that would be on um, the horizontal axis here. That would be month. And on the vertical axis, that would be temperature. So always add those into your data sets and label them appropriately for what your data is saying. <clears throat> and then also sometimes it depends how you're presenting your data. A chart title is useful. Uh, so if you're putting so this chart title here, and that would give this 2019 average temperature. If you're putting your data into something like a research article or a Word document, you're going to add a figure caption anyways, and it doesn't necessarily need a title because the reader is going to look at it regardless to make sense of the wordage. Um, where I find chart titles become very handy is when the chart is on a poster and you want that chart to catch somebody's eye, and the title of that chart could help catch eye or catch the eye. So you could say something like, uh, in 2019, February had extremely low temperatures, and on a poster that might catch somebody's eye, and then you can explain to them, okay, well, I have this graph that shows the average temperature throughout the year, and you can see in the summer it gets warmer, and in the winter it gets colder, and in February, oh, it got really cold, it, the average temperature was at zero. So chart titles can be very useful that way. Um, you can add labels to your data, and uh, what that will do is just give these certain points, it'll show um, the data of these certain points. But when you have a very simple graph like this, you don't really need it because you can tell exactly what's happening. Um, you can add error bars, which is just the percentage of error. You can add grid lines or take grid lines away from it. So sometimes charts look better if you don't have these grid lines in the background. Um, I always just keep them on. Uh, you can add legends, which are very, very useful if you have multiple data sets on one chart. So sometimes you'll, you'll compare uh, two pieces of XRF data from the synchrotron, and you'll overlap them on one graph. And one might have a green line, and one might have a red line. Um, but nobody knows what the green line means or the red line means unless you have a legend. So those are very important if you have more than one data set. Or even if you have one data set and you want to just make sure that people know exactly what you're talking about. And then trend lines can just give you some really inf interesting uh, statistical data if you're interested, more interested in looking at um, the statistics side of things. Um, 
Yeah, and then if you already create your plot and you don't like how it looks or you, you screwed up uh, selecting the data, you can just select data and redo um, any of the data you selected. I typically don't even use that. If I screw up making a plot, I'll just delete it and go back and highlight everything again. Um, using these functions up here, you can change the colors and the backgrounds. Um, using this function here, you can also change colors and um, all those types of things. Uh, if you double click on the axis, you can change, you can zoom in or out of your chart and change the axis numbers. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. And there are just, there's tons of resources online for help with just Excel in general, but also using Excel for synchrotron data. Uh, the Canadian Light Source has a lot of very, very uh, specific videos that help graph XRF uh, data or graph Zane's data. And it's very detailed step by step. And if you have the basics, like I've talked about in this presentation, um, and you have synchrotron data that you want to plot, uh, these videos will help you in that next step of actually plotting XRF or Zane's data. Um, there's also a YouTube channel uh, that has a playlist made exactly for this that you can find if you go onto this light source. Uh, web page and this web light source web page just has more um, wordage information about it, whereas this YouTube playlist is more just videos about how to uh, plot and play with the data. And it also it all just comes from trial and error and um, playing around with it and getting familiar with it all. And it, people can always reach out to me if they want to uh, ask me about their data or what their data, what I think their data could be saying or the story that could be coming along. Um, I'm always happy to help out with that. And I think that's it for this video. All right. Uh, thank you, Zach, for sharing your tips and tricks uh, with Excel, especially in the context of Secretron data. We do get a lot of students who sometimes are experiencing Excel for the first time and, and you know, it's like you said, it's a lot of trial and error with that, and it's a learning experience. And like you said, even these videos, there's tons of other videos out there too to provide different perspectives, but it's always interesting to capture what that means in the context of synchrotron and synchrotron data. So thank you so much for sharing your video and sharing your wisdom. And uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, talk to you again. <laughs>